Thank you so much, Bob. It means a lot to me. I, uh, I really enjoy doing the FMARS program, and uh, I appreciate your recognition of what I've done. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm actually going to tell you guys a little bit about the mission, uh, some of the things that happened, not everything, but uh, the, the highlights at least, uh, and talk about the larger uh, Mars Arctic 365 uh, program in general. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, so I served as the field season director and the crew commander uh, for uh, the expedition this summer. Um, I'm planning on going up and leading the refit mission, the second refit mission, uh, next summer before the one-year crew comes in, uh, provided Bob will allow me to continue to serve in that manner. Uh, a little bit about my, myself. I consider myself an entrepreneur. I have a lot of uh, startup experience. Um, pretty much my whole career has been focused on aerospace startups. Um, trained as an engineer, I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, master's degree in nuclear engineering. Um, and uh, I consider myself a leader. I, uh, I like leading teams. I like, like working in a program management type of role. Um, and the focus of my life has always been uh, to help further the human exploration and settlement of Mars. So uh, I'm very happy to be working with the Mars Society towards that end. Right now, my current uh, employment, my, my day job, is uh, with a company called Earthrise Space. It's the Omega Envoy team competing in the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, although, actually, I'm, uh, I'm looking to make a move, uh, hopefully in the near term, and uh, focus a little bit on where my passion lies. Uh, going to the moon is nice, but it's nothing compared to Mars. So, so uh, I am available for work if... Uh <laughs> Before I worked for uh, Earthrise Space, I was the vice president of another startup company called Four Frontiers Corporation, uh, and we did two design studies of what an initial uh, permanent Mars settlement would be like, what would the infrastructure needs be, and how would you build such a settlement. Um, and in terms of what I've done with the Mars Society, uh, I actually first read the case for Mars uh, when I was an undergrad, and as I think many, if not all, of the people in this room, I was inspired by that. Um, and really led uh, a direction for my life. Uh, I was part of the uh, MIT chapter of the Mars Society while I was at MIT, working my grad work, uh, attended many conventions, and then in 09, I was selected along with a number of fellow crew members that put in an application together uh, to take part in the 09 FMARS expedition. So uh, this summer's expedition was actually my second trip to the station. So what is Mars Arctic 365? Uh, quite simply, uh, it is going to be a groundbreaking Mars simulation uh, in the Canadian Arctic. It's going to do all the things that we've done in previous Mars simulations at MDRS or at FMARS, uh, but it's going to take it to a whole new level. Um, it's really going to prove that we can take a team of, of dedicated individuals, put them in a harsh environment, give them a set of tasks to do, and we're going to see them succeed by working as a team and overcoming those challenges together, just as the first human crew on Mars is going to have to do. This really, I feel, will be the most realistic Mars simulation in history. For those of you who are not familiar with the FMARS program and where FMARS is, uh, there's a map there, so you can see it's uh, pretty much as far north as you can go on commercial airline, uh, airliners, and then you have to uh, charter a bush plane to take you even further into the Arctic uh, to get to Devon Island where the station is deployed. Um, it's a Mars analog site. Um, it shares, it has uh, certain characteristics. For instance, it can be, get very cold in the winter down to about minus 40. Uh, it's very remote. It's about 1,000 miles from the North Pole. And uh, it's the site of an impact crater, uh, the Hawking Crater. Um, so this is shock terrain, there's very little vegetation since you're so far north. It's a good Mars analog site. What I really like about it is that it forces you to think like a Martian um, because you have to go through this long, arduous journey to get there in the first place. Uh, you know, it's very expensive and difficult to get supplies and equipment on site. Uh, if something breaks, you can't just run to the corner hardware store or the local Home Depot because 
they're thousands of miles away from you. Uh, so you really have to improvise, you have to work together as a team with the limited set of supplies and equipment that you have to overcome whatever challenge, challenge you're facing. It's not something that you're going to get from trying to do a simulation in the backyard at JSC, uh, you know, where you could just run back into the lab or you can run down to the corner hardware store. Why is this important? Why is this mission important? Um, because it's never been done before. Um, you know, past FMARS expeditions have ranged from anywhere between a couple of days, a week long, a month long, to uh, I think it was four months in 2007. Uh, but the crew, a crew has never spent a full year at the station, including uh, wintering over. Now, if you look at, at beyond just FMARS and maybe what we do with MDRS, but you look at other Mars simulations, Mars 500, um, you know, isolation studies, uh, there certainly have been uh, useful things uh, that we have learned from that. There have been insights and, and very useful data that we've gained. But I don't think that any of them have gone to the level that we're going to go with this mission. Um, and I listed eight factors here. Um, you've got extreme isolation with very limited access and resupply capability. Uh, the duration of the simulation, well certainly there have been, you know, Mars 500 was certainly longer. Um, this is a good length of time. Uh, if you talk to the psychologists, um, they'll tell you that if you put a crew in isolation for a short period of time, say up to several months, uh, they can basically tough it out. Well, you're not going to be able to do that in this mission. So you're going to see some really interesting things happen from a psychological perspective with this crew. And hopefully we make the right choices in the selection of that crew so that, uh, that these are positive things and not necessarily negative things. Uh, the cold temperatures, certainly that's, that's uh, important. Uh, the Mars analog environment, which I already talked about. Uh, the fact that you've got the crew in, in what is a very realistic habitat. Now certainly uh, some of the fixtures and finishes might be a little rough or, or inaccurate, but you know, you're in this remote Mars-like place in a, I think, a pretty good representation of what an initial Mars habitat would be like. Um, so I think that certainly plays into it as well. You've got uh, the crew up there doing realistic science, they're testing equipment, they're testing procedures, uh, various pieces of technology um, that are very similar or representative of what initial human Mars explorers would have to try to use. Um, and instead of just sitting in a lab environment, uh, you know, in a major city, they're actually out in this remote field environment doing hard work in a harsh environment um, with schedule pressure. So this is very realistic. And also I think it's important to note that this is going to be a very high visibility, high profile type of project. Um, the public is going to have their eyes on this, especially with all the news, uh, you know, all the coverage in the news these days about various Mars initiatives and space initiatives. So, uh, you know, people are going to follow the story. They're going to want to identify with the crew. We're going to want to step up our game in terms of how we publicize and how we capitalize on this interest. So to sum that up, I really feel that in order for us to really understand what are the challenges that will be faced by the initial Mars explorers, we need more realistic Mars simulations. And this, I think, is going to go far beyond anything that's come before. So uh, we actually have broken this uh, Mars Arctic 365 into two different phases. Uh, phase one occurred this summer. It was basically a survey and refit mission, uh, and that's, I'm going to talk to you in detail about what happened during that. Uh, phase two is going to be us going up and completing the refit and then uh, leading into the one-year Mars simulation. So what did we accomplish uh, this season? Uh, quite a few things, actually. Um, we delivered a new generator. Uh, the generators that were up there were more intended for temporary standby use. They weren't intended to be run non-stop for a year. Uh, and so if you think about putting people into this environment that's so hard to get to and is, it literally is life-threatening. If you go outside in the depth of winter and you don't have the right equipment, you don't have the right clothes on, I mean, this is a lethal environment. So we have to take this very seriously. Um, the level of equipment and infrastructure and backups that you're going to need 
in order to do this safely is quite different from what we've had to deal with for, say, a one-month expedition, which is the typical up there during the height of the Arctic summer. So we, we're bringing up uh, uh, one new, we brought up one new generator. We're going to bring up another new generator next season. Uh, we delivered a, a new ATV. We actually had Arctic Cat uh, provide a pretty significant discount. Uh, so we have one that was, we actually flew all the way onto site and made use of, and then we have another two that we purchased and got up to Resolute and we'll bring in next season. Um, we deployed an InstaBerm, which is a containment area for holding fuel, uh, holding fuel drums, and we stockpiled some fuel, and we're going to have to bring a lot more fuel in to support running a generator 24-7 for 365. Uh, we also brought in some new cooking equipment, um, and we also brought up a metal storage shed. And this is important not only for storing equipment and materials that we're going to need for the one-year mission, um, but it's also important to uh, protect our investment in these new generators. So we're going to actually put the generators inside the shed. We also had another, uh, another company called Tempcoat donated uh, this pretty amazing insulating paint. It's these little ceramic spherules in a latex matrix that uh, we're going to apply to the underside of the HAB. Um, if any of you are familiar with the story of how the HAB was initially is constructed, um, the, there was a paradrop that failed, and that paradrop contained all of the floors. Uh, and so while the walls and the dome of the HAB are very well insulated, they're this honeycomb uh, fiberglass material with about an R50 uh, insulation value, uh, the floor is just plywood. Uh, so we really need to do a better job of insulating the HAB so that we make sure we keep the crew warm. And we'll, we've got it up, it's in Resolute, and we're going to take it over to the station and apply it next season. Um, we also assessed the ground conditions right where we were going to install this shed because we weren't sure exactly how difficult it would be to drill into the permafrost and could we put anchors in. And, and we were amazed, actually, it was very easy to drill into the permafrost. And if you put a metal rod down into this hole you've drilled and you just come back 30 minutes later, you know, the, the water has where it was uh, on the surface, it, it had become water instead of ice. It had all come in there, and it actually makes this metal rod now part of the permafrost. It's kind of like uh, uh, the sword and the stone. You can't pull it out. And it turns out this is how they anchor buildings uh, routinely all over the Arctic. So we won't have any problem deploying the shed next season. Um, we surveyed a couple of new airstrips. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we don't run into a situation where a plane's trying to come in and land, and we've got a crosswind. So we wanted to have another airstrip that was perpendicular to that one so that we could, we could make use of it in that case. Um, we also delivered a new weather station. Uh, the weather station that is on site hasn't worked for a long time, so we brought a new one up. Uh, and we had Iridium donate a couple of satellite phones, so we made use of those up there. Uh, of course, we did some cleanup organization. Um, and very importantly, we surveyed the station. No one had been there since when I, w I was actually the last one on site in 2009. So before we started this expedition, we didn't even know, is the thing still standing? Uh, you know, has the floor collapsed? So we got up there and we, we, uh, we looked at it, and everything was exactly as I had left it in 09. So that was a very good sign. And I got to tell you, that, that station is very well designed and constructed. Uh, the, the structure itself is very, very sound. Uh, so no problems there. We did identify some stuff that we need to do on the inside, though. Um, so we have uh, this, this cabinetry in the upstairs of the HAB, and because it's so well insulated and sealed, moisture tends to build up up there, and so we had some mold issues. And so we're going to be replacing the cabinetry. We're going to be replacing the, the carpet next season and uh, going through all of the electrical and plumbing systems just to make sure everything's up to snuff. We don't have a fire. We don't have a flood uh, for the crew. So that's pretty much what we accomplished this summer. Uh, next summer, um, we're going to continue the refit activities. Probably it'll be about two to three weeks on station for the refit crew. And then I'm hoping there can be a little bit of overlap. We can bring in the full-time crew and have some training of them on how the systems work and how to maintain them uh, before the refit crew gets out of there. Uh, let's see, I mentioned a lot of this, we're going to be delivering more ATVs, some snowmobiles, because when there's two feet of snow on the ground, that's how you're not going to be using the ATVs. Get the shed up, install the generator, install the second generator, uh, and then 
one of the things also about these generators is instead of having the radiator for it incorporated as part of the generator, um, we actually have remote radiators. So we'll actually be able to put one of these right outside the shed, and then the other one we're going to install inside the hab. And so we can take all of that waste heat from the generator, and instead of dumping it into the environment and wasting it, we're going to dump that directly into the hab to heat the hab in the wintertime. So that, that'll be really good. Uh, let's see, bring in more fuel, bring in food. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of food they're going to burn through over the course of one year expedition. Uh, and I've got some pictures here. So this was the ATV that we, uh, we picked up in Yellowknife and brought on site. Here we've got some, uh, some buckets of the temp coat insulation. And then there's the shed being delivered to our staging location in Yellowknife. So I've got some pictures. I'll kind of pictorially walk you through uh, this year's expedition. Uh, one of the things we were really fortunate to have uh, this season was we had a couple of pi private pilots. Uh, they own their own uh, bush planes, their own Kodiak, Quest Kodiak uh, aircraft um, that you see here, the yellow one and the blue one. Um, and these are capable of flying us all the way up to the Arctic and actually landing on the, the dirt airstrip on Devon. Um, so they were gracious enough to provide use of their planes, uh, their piloting skills, and all of the fuel to get us and our gear up there and back. So that was just phenomenal. Because usually what we have to do is rely on twin otters that we have to uh, charter at great expense, and we didn't have to do that this season. We also, I, I want to uh, make sure that I point out and thank uh, Barry Stott, Barry, there in the audience. Um, Barry made a very generous cash contribution to this mission, in addition to uh, being instrumental in the planning of it and in the actual execution. Uh, so the plane that you see in the background between the two Kodiaks there is uh, Barry's 421. So he actually flew some of the gear and the crew up to Yellowknife. And uh, it was very important that he was on the ground there in Yellowknife and could help uh, manage logistics for us. Uh, so thank you very much, Barry, for making this possible. So uh, we all met in Driggs, Idaho, which is where the, uh, the two Kodiaks were based, loaded up, and started headed, uh, flying north. Uh, we started by flying over the Grand Tetons, which was just spectacular. So I was actually in the uh, back of the yellow Kodiak here, taking a picture out the window. And you can see the blue Kodiak in the distance there uh, with the Tetons in the background. Got some good shots. We flew in formation uh, the whole way up. And the further north you go, uh, the more bleak the landscape gets. So, uh, you know, this was, I think, somewhere uh, just north of Yellowknife. And you could see that we'd gotten well past the point where uh, there's forests and trees. Uh, so you just kind of have grasslands. Of course, then if you keep going further north, it starts to look like this. So this was actually a picture over Devon Island uh, when we were going to put into the station. So we landed on Devon, and we found that uh, it was a much wetter, colder place than I had experienced back in 09. In 09, apparently, we had a pretty dry year, uh, a warm year, so things had, had all dried out. All the snow had melted uh, pretty much before we got there, uh, and there wasn't much mud to speak of. It was pretty dusty. Uh, that was not the case uh, this time. So I don't know if this has something to do with climate change or what, uh, but we got there, and this is the creek that was flowing very high, and uh, these big snow banks, you know, this was a, at least a foot thick snow. Uh, so there was some uh, shoveling involved in order to get everything over to the hab. But we did get up to the hab. Um, we actually went in uh, with a spearhead group, uh, myself, uh, uh, Justin Sumter, and Adam Mayer. Uh, so this is us in front of the station there, I think the first or second day. And as I said, the, the HAB was in very good condition. It was pretty much as we had, as I had left it in 09, uh, with one exception. So in 09, we had put in place uh, the secondary containment area, which is basically rubber stretched over boards that we put our fuel drums on. And if the fuel drums leaked, then it would catch the fuel and keep it from going into the environment. Well, this is what's left of uh, part of that secondary containment area. So uh, this is evidence of a polar bear. Uh, finding this kind of interesting and digging into it. And, and quite frankly, when I was on site and I saw this, it was, it was terrifying. <laughs> I actually brought
brought back a uh, souvenir. So later we were walking down the ridge and I found the missing piece of that instaburm. And uh, so if you want to come up later and take a look at this, you can see where the bear put his claws into it, where he not, you know, chewed on it and actually ripped it off. Uh, so we're going to be auctioning this off a little bit later. <laughs> nice little souvenir. So I mentioned all this thick snow. Yes, unfortunately, I did get our new generator stuck in a snowbank. Uh, but not to worry, we had a crew, a resourceful crew on site, and we were able to load it up and get it over to the hat. We also, uh, I mentioned we deployed the Instaberm, so this is what the Instaberm looks like with a couple fuel drums in it. Uh, so this will actually hold 30 drums. Uh, we're going to need somewhere on the order of 100 drums to run one of the new generators continuously for a year. Uh, so we'll have to kind of evaluate, depending upon what kind of aircraft support we have next summer, uh, whether we bring in more Instaberms and more fuel all at once, or if we do it kind of over time as the mission progresses. Of course, uh, we had to uh, uh, do some of the things that uh, are FMARS traditions. So the crew always uh, signs their name on the whiteboard as uh, greetings for the next crew. Uh, and then in each stateroom, uh, there's a place where uh, each of the crew members that stayed in that stateroom signed. So obviously, I was there in 09, so I got to sign this one twice. Uh, and then it's, it's, you can't leave FMARS without having some cheese whiz. And yes, the crew did watch Mars attacks. Ack, 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 ack. So we were working pretty hard up there because we had a lot of tasks that we were trying to accomplish in a very short amount of time. Um, but we did, uh, I did feel as, as crew commander, you know, these guys deserve a little R&R. &R. We got to go out and, and let them see a little bit of the island. So we took a, a hike over to Cornell Lake, which is, uh, well, a couple miles from the hab, it's within walking distance. Of course, we had to carry our guns in case uh, a polar, an encounter with a polar bear. But I mentioned that, uh, that Devon was a wet, muddy place. Well, I think you can see in this photo, this was actually before we got the mud guards up from Yellowknife. We got the ATV on site, but not the mud guards. Uh, so it, it was pretty dirty. And Justin kind of found out the hard way just how muddy a place it was. Uh, he had an encounter with the infamous Devon Island quick mud. Uh, so he's a, he's a much taller guy than he looks in this picture. It's because from the knee down, he's in the mud. Um, basically what happens is the surface layer dries out and it looks like good stable ground to walk on. You walk on it and you pass right through that layer and there's a thick layer of mud until you get to the permafrost layer. Uh, so he was in no danger of, you know, sinking up above his head and drowning, uh, but he was stuck really stuck, so I had to go over and pull him out, and we did save him. He wasn't too happy about the experience. But. And we also did a very short uh, EVA the last night before we pulled out, so here's Adam uh, getting all dressed up in the spacesuit and heading out and uh, just getting a feel for how that, that was. Just a pedestrian EVA down the ridge and back. And uh, at one point there, we had the, the, the pilots flying back and forth to Yellowknife, bringing up more supplies and equipment, and the other crew members uh, that couldn't come up on the initial trip. Uh, so we've got Justin, we've got uh, Rich Spencer, uh, or no, I'm sorry, that's Rich Sugden. There I am, Adam. Uh, that's Garrett Edquist, who's going to hopefully be putting together a documentary video about FMARS. Uh, and then Rich Spencer, one of the other pilots, and Alex Kumar. And this was the last photo that we uh, took from the air of the HAB as we were flying out, uh, showing the HAB and the infrastructure, waiting for us to come back and finish the job that we started, uh, finish it next year. So in summary, get involved. Please spread the word about what we're trying to do here. Uh, contribute generously and help us make this mission possible. Thank you. Let's take a couple questions. Anybody? Yes. Uh, I'd have
have to go look up the numbers. Uh, it gets pretty strong up there. Um, we did take that into account when we selected the steel structure, uh, but I don't remember the number off the top of my head. Not the diesel fuel, uh, or even I think the gas and the propane would be a problem. Um, one of the reasons that we replaced the stove in the, uh, in the kitchen and half uh, was because it ran off the propane. And the propane, number one, it wouldn't be any good in the cold temperatures, it kind of gels. And number two, um, we had a real problem with the humidity buildup. And, you know, if you're basically having combustion in the upper story of the half, it's sealed so tightly. Uh, in 09, we had problems with the water literally dripping down our heads from the ceiling from the condensation. Uh, so we've gone completely electric in the half at this point. Uh, there is no more propane. Yes? What's the distance that, uh, the, the furthest distance that operations would take place from the half? What's, what's safe for the crews to go out to if any of the science missions take place? Will they be spending any overnights? Outside of the half plane? I don't know if they're going to spend, I don't think they're going to spend any overnights uh, outside. Um, typically, what you want to do is not travel so far in the ATVs that if they break down, you couldn't walk back in a reasonable amount of time. I know that, I think it was the 07 crew uh, actually staged fuel a distance out, so they, they kind of broke that requirement. They went much further than they could walk back because they wanted to get to the shore and actually see the shore. Um, so, we really haven't set all the operational parameters yet for the one-year expedition. Um, we're going to have to think about that, though, because, again, you know, if you get stranded out there and you're a good distance from the half and it's 40 degrees below, you know, this could be problematic. Sure. Take it from the select what food to take up there to pre-position uh, this summer. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to be bringing a lot more food in, so I'm pretty sure she's going to still be involved in that. Um, and I think she also had involvement in the High Seas Project, so I'm sure that there will be some uh, cross-pollinization and lessons learned applied there. <laughs> 